Hi all, we're now going to talk about how to use induction to show the correctness of algorithms that have recursive functions in it. So obviously I expect you to be okay with induction. If you need to have a quick refresher, I made a video just before this one talking about induction. You can also find a lot of resources online. But just a quick review now, um, just to make sure we're on the same page. Induction is a method of proofing that you use to prove a statement to be true for all values of n greater than or equal to one. Well, most of the time we choose n to be greater than or equal to one, but really um, it can be anything as long as it's out of sequence. So you see zero sometimes, but you can also see any number. As long as the sequence like one, two, three, four, five, um, then you can use induction to prove the statement. So you can't use induction on real numbers, for example, because that's not really a sequence. Um, in, in in a proof by induction, you will have a base case. So you first have to show that this statement is true for n equal to 1 or n equals to 0 or whatever the start of sequence is. And then you have the induction step. Um, this is where you assume that the statement is true. We call this the induction hypothesis. So you assume the statement is true for some value k, where k is greater than the starting point. And then you show that if it's true for k, then it's also true for k plus 1. So what happened here is by, by doing so, if you can show that statement is true for 1, and also you show that statement is true, well, if it's true for k, then it's true for k plus 1, then what you have done is you have, to sh you have shown that the statement is true for 1, then it's also true for 2. If it's true for 2, it's also true for 3. If it's, if it's true for 3, it's also true for 4, and so on, for all possible values of n. And that's what induction is. And so induction is very closely related to loops and also to recursions and computer science because that's pretty much what we do in loops and recursions. When you have a loop, you always start at 0 or 1. Well, most of the time, you will start at 0 or 1. So your progression goes like 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. When you have a recursion, you will always have a base case. Well, if it's a recursion that actually stops, you will have a base case. Um, so it's the other way around now. Uh, let's say your base case is zero. Your regression will go three, two, one, and it goes to zero and it stops. And in both both regression and um, loops, we have a starting point, and when we keep on doing the same thing again and again, so it's uh, only natural that we can use induction to try to prove the correctness of these two, um, well, of, of regression and loops. So for this lecture. We're only going to be talking about algorithms that have uh, recursive functions in it. Um, if you want to show the correctness of an algorithm that has a loop in it, then you have to use a loop variant. That's what we're going to be talking about in the next lecture. So both are based on the same principles, sure. But uh, make sure you don't get them mixed up. Because um, if I ask you a question to show something using a loop variant, like here I give you a um, iterative algorithm and please use a loop invariant to show that this is correct then you have to use a loop invariant to do that people did get them mixed up uh, last year uh, so please don't do that also um, we're going to be doing simple algorithms only like stuff you already know how to write in first year and second year because you are learning something new here um, so we use something simple to show it to you it's just like when you learn programming first time you'd be solving easy problems so same thing here, you're going to be learning to proof something properly and I'm going to be throwing simple problems at you. Um, also another important point there, don't forget that to show that an algorithm is correct, you have to show that it terminates. So sometimes that is an extra step that you have to take. But anyway, the most important takeaway from this lecture from this week, like all this talk about correctness, all this talk about proofing things, you may not remember how to do this years from now but at least you have an idea how it works. And I always claim that you already do this in your mind anyway. When you're writing a code, when you're writing a loop, when you're writing a recursive function, you already have an idea on how to write it correctly. So this whole idea of proving something is already in you. And we're just going to um, try to do that in writing formally uh, with this unit. Now, one thing that is slightly different from um, algorithms with recursive functions and just um, induction. 
Well, uh, when you see induction, most of the time, you only see a progression from one to two to three to four. It's, a, it's like a linear progression, just one case to the next case to the next case to the next case. And obviously that's not true with recursive function, like at least once you've been writing. I mean, if you have Fibonacci, something very simple like a Fibonacci function, well, this is something you should not be writing in recursive manner, but if you do write Fibonacci recursively, you can see that one case depends on uh, two other cases, right? If you want to count Fibonacci 4, you need to compute Fibonacci 3 and Fibonacci 2. So, of course, this makes um, analyzing the correctness much harder because um, one one case will spawn many, many cases. So, we'll try to avoid those ones. Um, I do have one or two examples where you will have um, several cases. And we can still do that. Just like induction, actually, you can still use induction when you have uh, uh, several cases. Um, but yeah, just be aware of this. Um, and we're going to start very simple. We're going to start very slow. We're going to start with a um, function to compute factorial, something you have done in first year, I'm sure. In fact, this is the example that I used in the previous video when I talked about proof by induction, which is a bit silly uh, because it's just a definition of factorial. But if you want to, you can look at the previous video um, and check out the similarities between the proof by induction and what we're going to be doing now. So in both cases, we always start with the base case and we basically have to show that this algorithm is correct when n is equal to 1. That's the base case there. And yes, it is because factorial 1 is just 1. That's the definition of 1 factorial. So yes, the algorithm is correct for the base case. Now, will the algorithm terminate? Yes. Because every time you call this uh, function recursively, you reduce n by 1. So eventually, n will hit 1. If n is greater than 1, eventually it will be reduced down to 1. And if n is already less than 1, it will just uh, return 1 and finish the function call. So yes, it will terminate. Next, we go to the induction step. And our hypothesis here is that the algorithm is correct for some value k greater than 1. So that means that we assume that factorial k does return k factorial. So we don't know if this is true, but we just assume that it is. So what we have to do now is we have to show that the algorithm is also correct for k plus 1. And this is where we have to do the most work. Now, what happens when n is, n is equal to k plus 1? So we're going to be going to line 5, where we compute k plus 1 times factorial k. Now, we assume that factorial k is going to give us k factorial. So line 5 is going to give us k plus 1 times k factorial. And that is the definition of k plus 1 factorial. So yeah, if the algorithm is correct for k, it will also be correct for k plus 1. And there you have it. I have proved by induction that factorial n returns n factorial for all n greater than or equal to 1. So in summary, here's what happens. We show the base case. We show that factorial 1 is correct. Okay. And then with the induction step, we assume that factorial k is correct. And if k is correct, we show that factorial k plus 1 is also correct. And we're also going to use induction to show that this code is correct. Uh, specifically, we're going to show that this statement, the one that I'm highlighting now, is always true for different values of i. And I'm going to talk more about what value i can take in a bit. But we're going to be doing all the same thing. We're going to start from i to zero. We're going to show that the uh, base case is correct. We're going to uh, pick an induction hypothesis, right? And then we're going to show that if this hypothesis um, sorry, if it's correct for i to the k, then we also show that the algorithm is correct for i to the k plus 1. Okay, but just to be clear um, on how the algorithm works, just remember that we're computing the terms from the back. So if I give you i equal to 0, you're going to be giving me just the constant term. If I give you i equal to 2, you're going to give me the last three terms. If you give me i equal to 4, you're going to give me the final five terms. Um, but the main goal here, again, 
is to show that um, this statement, the one that I'm highlighting, we're going to show that that statement is always true for values value of i. Now, um, it's important to talk about what value i can take. Uh, obviously, this algorithm is not going to work if i exceeds n. If you have a polynomial of degree n, and then you give it n plus 1, well, so you got a polynomial of degree 10, and you give me i equal to 20, then I won't be able to evaluate that. I mean, I can probably fix the code that um, handle that, but let's just assume um, we're getting nice inputs. So for my induction hypothesis, I assume the uh, that the statement is correct for k, for i equal to k. And here I'm saying that k is got to be between 0 and n, so greater than 0 and less than n. And while we're on that topic, I should probably do something about the i on um, this function as well, on uh, line 2, because what happens if someone give i equal to negative 5, for example? That will um, screw up the code. So let's just assume that the input is going to be nice, that someone's going to give you i between 0 and n all the time. Because I just want to focus on how to do the induction. Um, we can take care of all these little um, problems. Like you just modify the code a bit more, but if I do that, I'm just going to offer complicated code. So I think it's just better to just mention that I do have some problems here. It's not completely terse, uh, but the focus is on how we do the induction. So just keep that in mind. All right, uh, now the base case. Is the statement correct when i equal to zero? Well, when i equal to zero, I just want to return the uh, constant terms. And when i equal to zero, the statement does return just c zero, right? It just, um, when i equal to zero, everything else would be zero. So we just kind of return the constant term. So yeah, um, the statement, the, uh, the function evaluate um, x zero is correct. It gives me c zero. Will the algorithm terminate? Uh, yeah, it will, because um, if you give me a positive i, I'm going to recurse, and I'm going to reduce i by 1 every time I recurse. So eventually, it will reach the base case. It will eventually reach i equal to 0, and yes, it will terminate. Okay. For the induction step, well, the induction hypothesis is just the same statement again with um, i equal to k. And as I mentioned, I'm going to say that um, k must be greater than 0 and must be less than n. So pretty simple there. And what we have to do is we have to show that <clears throat> assuming the um, evaluate k, sorry, evaluate x k is correct, then evaluate x k plus 1 will also be correct. As in, it will give me uh, c k plus 1 times x to the k plus 1 plus c k x to the k plus dot 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 plus 1. Yeah. So how do we do that? Well, let's look at the code. When i is equal to k plus 1, then the loop from line 5 to line 7 is going to c compute uh, x to the k plus 1. That's what t is going to be. Now, from our induction hypothesis, we assume that evaluate x k is going to give me c k x to the k plus dot 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 plus c1 x plus 1. So all we're doing in line 8, which is um, computing ck plus 1 times t, which is ck plus 1 times x to the k plus 1. And we add the return value of evaluate x k. So we just get the ck x to the k uh, plus dot dot dot, like the remaining term. Sorry, this is pretty hard to read. I mean, I hope you can just follow from the uh, my slides because it's pretty hard for me to just read the polynomials like that. But then the point is, we have shown that evaluate x k plus 1 does indeed give us c k plus 1 times x to the k plus 1 plus dot 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 or up to c0. So the statement is correct. So in summary, what we've done, we got a statement we want to prove. Um, we show that this statement is correct when um, i equal to 0. So the function evaluate x0 is correct. And then we go to the induction step. We assume that the function evaluate x k is correct 
and then we show that if that is correct, then evaluate x k plus 1 is also correct. So that means that evaluate x0 is correct, evaluate x1 is correct, evaluate x2 is correct, and more importantly, evaluate xn is correct, and it's going to give us fx. So we're not going to say that this function is correct for all values of uh, all possible values of n. Uh, well, as in, we're not going to say that evaluate xi works for every possible value of i because there's a limit on what, what value you can choose, right? Because you have a polynomial of degree n, so you should use um, input n in there. And if that's the input, it will work. It will give you the evaluation of fx. So that's the end of the proof. It's very similar to the first one. Um, so I hope you can see that this is pretty straightforward. Okay, so now let's go talk about complexity for a bit. Uh, let's go back to the code. Um, I mentioned that this code is slow. And I was wondering if you can suggest a simple improvement so that I can speed up this algorithm. So the reason why this code is slow is because every time I go to the function, every time I recurse, I have a for loop in there that will compute the powers of x. So I'm, I'm, if I compute x to the 5, I have to multiply x 5 times. And then I come in again when i equal to 10, I have to compute x to the 10. I have to do the uh, multiplication 10 times. So yeah, you can do the uh, multiplication faster than just doing it uh, like that. But you can also do this, like uh, look at the second code. Here I'm saying that every time you call the function, uh, multiply t by x. So I'm going to keep t as a global variable. Then every time I come in the function, I increment t, I multiply by x. So yeah, it cost me one global variable space. But now every time I go inside the function, I just have to do one multiplication instead of doing a for loop. Um, and I can actually do better. I can go from two multiplication to just one multiplication. And this is what we call the Horner's method. So this is for pretty um, uh, advanced code. Um, well, it might be hard for some of you to understand. So we're going to talk about this code. Um, you know, just feel free to pause the video and just run the code with some examples if you need to. All right, we're going to talk about Honor's method. It's still the same thing. It's still going to compute the uh, polynomial. It's going to evaluate the polynomial. But it works in a different way. Now that we're going to start from zero, we're not going to start from n. We're actually going to finish at n. When i is equal to n, that's when we finish. So when you call this, you have to call it from zero. So just think about what's happening when um, i is equal to n, when i could n minus one, so on. All right, so I have it down there. So I'm going to call from i equal to zero. Okay, we're just going to recur and calling um, i equal to one. We're just going to rec recur again, calling i equal um, to two and so on. So you will, um, you will construct the polynomial in a strange way and like the other way around. Um, I'll show you what I mean. Like previously, uh, when you construct a, this polynomial, let's say 4x cubed plus x squared plus 7x plus 3, right? You construct it from the constant, right? And then you work out the next um, term, 7x, and you work out x squared, and finally you work out 4x cubed. It's simple. With the honest method, you evaluate the same polynomial, you start from 4, and you're actually going to just compute 4, Right, and then you multiply that by x, and you add the next constant. So here, the next constant is one. So I'm going to do four x plus one. You see, it, like four x plus one is not in the polynomial. Like these are two terms which are not in the polynomial. You don't see four x plus one in there. You see four x cubed plus x squared. But this method works because what happens if you keep on multiplying by x, right? Um, next term I'm going to get four x squared plus x plus seven. It's getting there. And finally, I'm going to multiply by x again. I'm going to add 3. I'm going to get 4x cubed plus x squared plus 7x plus 3. So this is the honest method. And this is actually hard to evaluate. Well, induction is always simple. Because in the induction, you always do base case, um, pick the uh, hypothesis, which is the statement you're trying to prove. Um, and then, you know, if it's true for k, show that's true for k plus 1. 
But now, what is the base case? Like, even what, what are we even trying to prove? What is the statement that we're trying to prove? The hard thing in this example is actually working out what is it that we're trying to prove? What is the statement that we're trying to prove? So if you look at how the algorithm works, um, honor xn is just cn. Honor x0 is actually the whole polynomial. That's the answer. We, so we start with um, we start with 0, but it goes back all the way up to n. So honor xn will give you cn. Honor x0 will give you the whole polynomial. And I'm thinking maybe I should say honor xi equal to ci xi plus the dot, whatever I have there. Is it? Well, actually not. This is the uh, relationship. This is this is the this is the statement we're trying to prove. So notice the uh, uh, subscript and superscript, right? It's not c i x to the i, but it's actually c n times x to the n minus i, and we're just gonna discard negative parts of x. So, so imagine if you put an n in there, if you put i equal to n, you're gonna have c n x to the n plus c n minus one times x to the n minus one minus n, which is just x to the minus one. So we discard those. Just just get rid of our, our negative powers of x. That's how this will work. Okay, and that's actually is the hardest part of the proof. Like we're going to prove that the Horner's method work using induction again. And the trickiest bit is to find that actual statement, because when we once we have the statement. So I'm writing up here. Once you have the statement, uh, the base case is simple, right? The base case, uh, you can see that the base case is when i equal to n. And of course, like just before, uh, just as before, just assume we have a sane input for i. So i is going to be between 0 and n. Well, actually, in this case, we always think about i is going to be n because we want to evaluate that polynomial size n. Oh, sorry, of degree n. So the base case there is honor xn, and it's going to give us cn. Which is, which means that the uh, statement up here is correct. Now, is this algorithm going to terminate? Yeah, it will, because if we start at i equal to zero, we are we're going to be increasing i plus. Um, we're going to be increasing i every time we make a recursive call. So i becomes i plus one, i plus two, and so on. Eventually, it will reach n. In which case, the algorithm will terminate. So yes, it will terminate. The base case is correct. Um, good, we're good to go. Moving on to the induction step. Uh, what is the hypothesis? Just a statement up there. But put in k instead of i, and you're done. That's your induction hypothesis. And finally, we got to show that um, the next step, like uh, we assume that Honor x k is correct, then we have to show that Honor x k minus 1 is also correct. Now, not k plus 1, it's actually k minus 1. Why? Because we keep on uh, increasing i, right, as we go. So, so what happened is, um, like before, we, we say that, oh, if it's true for 1, then it's going to be, then 2 is going to be true as well. If 2 is true, then 3 is going to be true as well. Now, we're flipping that now. We, we, now we're saying that, oh, if it was true for n, then it will be true for n minus 1 as well. If it's true for 5, then it will be true for 4. Why? Because the end goal is you want to show that this is correct for i equal to 0. All right, so we have to do it the other way around. And to actually do that is pretty simple. Um, it's just, uh, there's only one line there, right? Just only line 5. That's the way we actually do any work. So if I call Horner x k minus 1, um, you're going to use Horner x k, and let's just assume Horner x k is correct. So I'll get this polynomial here in the brackets. Um, sorry, I can't help. Yep, that that one there. Assuming that is correct, I'm going to multiply by x. That's line five, and then I'm going to add uh, c i to it. I'm going to add c k minus one to it. And when I do that, I will end up with the polynomial. Um, well, the last line there. Sorry, again, it's hard to read this. Um, it's hard to read this uh, on the lecture, but um, 
if you just sit down and write this down or you can see it on a slide, um, hopefully you think that this is correct. Okay. So yeah, it's actually simple to show that the inductive relationship, this is simple to show that um, if it's true for Horner XK, then it's also true for Horner X K minus one. So again, in summary, this is induction. Um, we have this statement that we want to prove to be true, right? And um, with the goal is we want to show that this is true for i to zero. And we show that this is true for the base case. We show, we show that the uh, statement is true for i equal to n. The, the function works for i equal to n. And we also argue that if it's true for i equal to k, then it's also true for i equal to k minus 1. So it must be true for i equal to 0. Yeah, because it's true for 5, it's true for 4, it's true for 4, it's true for 3, and so on until we get to 0. We have shown by induction that our algorithm works. It does compute f to the x. Oh, sorry, uh, it does compute fx. Because if I have Horner x0, then from the uh, from what I have up here from the formula, you can see that Horner x0 gives you the whole polynomial. Okay. So that is yet another example of uh, induction to show correctness of recursive algorithm. Um, that one is pretty, uh, well, I think it's pretty complicated. But again, the hard thing is not the induction. The induction is easy. The hard thing is finding this um, this um, relationship here. Okay. All right, so that's pretty much the end of the lecture. Um, just a bit of trivia here. Um, can you prove? that this algorithm is also optimal. Now, it's not something I'm going to ask in COM3010. Well, if I do ask you, I'm going to give you a lot of hints. But if you're interested whether to see whether this is actually optimal, because it, it seems pretty fast, right? It seems pretty good. And you're only doing one multiplication. So you can go to Wikipedia to look for more information. But generally, yeah, this is optimal. Because you are evaluating a polynomial. Um, for every term, you do have to multiply. And every time you have to do addition, and here you are doing the minimum number of addition and multipli uh, multiplication because you're only doing it once, right? And like look at line five, you're doing one multiplication, and you're doing one addition. So this is the best way to evaluate polynomials, like in the general case. Okay, so that does it for um, um, induction and recursive functions. All right, we're gonna move on to loop invariance next. I'll see you in the next lecture.